Welcome to Mindset Matters, the show where we dive into all topics surrounding mindset, its importance, how it shapes our lives, the daily actions we take, and how it creates our future possibilities. Mindset Matters brings you stories and experiences from incredible people around the globe and provides the strategies to upgrade your mindset for success. Let's start designing your life from the inside out with your host, Rachel Withers. Hi there, and welcome to Mindset Matters. I'm Rachel Withers, and here at Mindset Matters, we are all about mindset and the importance that it plays in all aspects of our lives. We're here to talk about how you can create your own economy and really design your life from the inside out. And today I am just super, super excited. It is going to be an incredible show. I have a very, very special guest joining me today. Today I have William Nazaro with me, who likes to be called Bill. So, um, and what I want to really say about Bill is he is the co-founder of the Time to Lead Institute. He works with individuals who aspire to become recognized leaders to really advance their careers. And he works with organizations who want to improve their company's emerging leaders and really to increase their market performance and innovation. William has also written and it's an incredible chapter in Jack Canfield's book Success and as I say I am super super excited to have William Nazaro talking with me today and really talking about what it is to be a lifelong learner and really about growth mindset and how it can truly propel you and your team towards success. But just before I introduce William, I just wanted really to share with you what what my thoughts uh, and my experiences are of being a lifelong learner and really what it has done for me. Um, I think sometimes we all and um, we can get stuck in a rut simply you know doing that same job really doing all what, always what we have always done and thinking to ourselves is this it and really not taking any form of responsibility for for our lives and where we are right now and for me uh, at a very difficult time in my life it was when I made the decision that I actually needed to change. I needed to change something in my life. I started to truly invest in myself. I started to expand my mindset. And through that, I really developed a sense of belief and a sense of confidence and really to pursue my dreams, to go for my passion. And I can truly say I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today, which is talking to you, um, if I really hadn't made that decision to really dedicate myself to lifelong learning and I just before I introduce uh, Bill I just wanted to say that really figuring out what inspires you puts you right back in that driver's seat and it really is a reminder that you can really do things in life that you want to do and I just really wanted to share that with you today so Let's crack on. Let's let's kick off with this. So I would like to introduce William Nazaro and so we can really dive into dive into this. So William, thanks for being here. I am just super, super excited to have you um have you here today. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my absolute my pleasure. So really to kick off, Bill, it'd be great if you could really start by telling me a little bit about your background. What has really led you to the work that you today, do today with the Time to Lead Institute? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question as I was trying to kind of piece that together in my mind. Um, you know, it, it, is, uh, it is a 30-year journey. And, uh, you know, when I started out, uh, coming out of out of college, both my degrees were were in computer science, both my uh, undergraduate and my graduate degree. Um, and I started my career as a software developer and and pretty much as a software developer, individual contributor. And I really just enjoyed solving problems and building solutions. and and um, 
that was a passion that I, I had had since I was probably 13 years old or so, which was just solving problems and, and building computer solutions. And then in my late 20s, I was working at a particular company and my employer asked me to kind of head up a project that was struggling a little bit. And uh, I was on that team already as, as running the architecture for it, but they said, could you take it over and project manage it? And I kind of reluctantly said yes, but I've never been shy of taking on a new opportunity to see what that might be or how that might um, uh, yield itself to more learning or new experiences. And so I took on that particular responsibility and, and we, we did well with the project. And then they said, you know what, we'd like you to probably uh, lead up a team. Would you mind taking on this, this team and start to be a leader? And um, it's kind of funny in some ways because in the span of, of uh, a few years, I went from being an individual contributor to having over 100 people working for me. Yet I never really learned how to be a leader. I was always an individual contributor and being a member of a team. And then I started to see that my role was changing. And in some ways, in retrospect, when I look back, I, I, I could write a book on everything not to do um, as a leader just from those few years of experience that I did have. But I was I spent a lot of my time, this is in the, um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I spent a lot of my time reading books on management and I also was reading books uh, from Jack Welch but I was finding that that style really wasn't fitting me and it wasn't really how I wanted to show up. And, there, and most of the stuff was not really talking about leadership either, uh, Rachel. It was talking a lot more uh, about how to be a manager. And, um, and so I struggled for a, a really long time in, in making uh, mistakes and I made a lot of mistakes, which I've, you know, I've learned from and incorporated. And, I started to see that there was a difference between leadership and there's a difference between being a manager. And, you know, 20 some odd years ago, there really wasn't a lot, a lot of discussion about the two. It was more management because we were coming out of the 80s and 90s uh, where uh, we we're looking at more management science. And um, what this really drove me to, to, to focus on in the Time to Lead Institute is I'm trying to reach aspiring and emerging leaders. I'm trying to actually have programs and I'm trying to provide education, insight, assistance, support that I would have wanted when I first started to be a leader. And it doesn't really matter what your age is. Age is irrelevant. You know, at some point in time, you're all of a sudden you're going to be thrust into a more um, prominent leadership role. And I didn't have necessarily anywhere to really learn this. And so our whole approach, Rachel, is centered on the philosophy that leadership is not a title. Leadership is not a position on an org chart, all right, a little box that's sitting there on the org chart. Uh, leaders are developed. They're not born. And so we are really focusing on trying to, uh, to help companies and uh, to, to create their next generation of leaders. Um, and also we're trying to help individuals who want to be a leader in their, in their lives, lead themselves, uh, lead themselves in their communities, in their families, whatever it, uh, it happens to be for them. Thank you, Bill. And I think um, I really uh, liked your, your comment and about that a lead, it's not a title, it's not a position. And I think that that is um, so important to put that, put that across and get that through to people, that this isn't a title, it isn't a position, and it is a lifelong journey that you're truly on. And as I mentioned at, at the beginning of the show, you know, I truly believe that uh, as individuals, we really must expand our mind and really devote ourselves to this lifelong learning. It is absolutely the key to breaking through um, the success barriers that we that we may have. And what I think would be really great, Bill, is if you could just sort of share one of your experiences as a as a lifelong learner. Yeah, um, you know, Rachel, there's um, uh, this one particular story that I'm going to share with you actually can touch on many different facets. But this was about 10 years ago, and I was attending a class uh, out in out in Colorado. And I wrote about this in the chapter Lifelong Learner in uh, our book that we have uh, called Success. Uh, the instructor asked uh, to, for us to write our names and our little name tents or name tags that we were putting on the front of our desk. And the instructor uh, said in the upper right hand corner, what I'd love for you guys to do is to indicate your mastery of this topic. 
And on a scale of one to five, one being the lowest, five being the highest, I would like to know where you sit on the mastery of this topic. And then we're going to go around the room and we're going to introduce ourselves. And it was, it was kind of interesting because people were kind of sheepishly looking around and see what is everybody else going to write uh, on their name tent, you know, and some people like, I can't really put a five being uh, I'm the highest because there's the instructor here. And some people are like, well, I don't want to put a two because then I'm going to look like a dope to everybody. And, and so I wrote five and then I put five and I put an arrow one. And so the instructor gets to me as we're going around the room introducing ourselves because I am completely baffled by what you wrote there. What is that five arrow one? And I said, well, I actually think I have a very good mastery of this topic. I've been working in this for many years and I, and I think I know this very well. Uh, however, I am quite certain by the end of this class and maybe even by the, by the end of today, I'm going to feel like I'm back at one, that I'm a beginner again. And so I go really, and for the way I look at this is that I'm a five trending to one. And he goes, I love that. And so that to me is really important because if I just thought I was a five, if I thought I was the highest that I could ever be uh, in this, I would probably stop learning because I don't think there's anything that I can be taught. And rather, I said, look, I, I know what I know. I know it very well, but he's going to open me up to a whole new set of information that I probably don't even know exists. And I need to be open to that. And I need to be, remain humble and I need to remain teachable. And if I can remain humble and teachable, as opposed to being here and trying to let him know how much I know, which many of us do that. I used to do that a lot in my career. I'd sit through something and I wanted to make sure everybody knew what I knew. And now I sit in there and I go, you know what? I'm not here to teach other people. I'm not here to try to let people know what I know. I'm here to, to help grow myself. So that five training to one is a story I've used many times now, Rachel, to kind of illustrate what it really means to be, to, uh, to be a lifelong learner. Um, absolutely. And we are going to touch on the ego a little bit later in this, um, in this show, because I think, um, you know, the five to the one, I think that that is fascinating and the ego can, can come in. So we're going to be touching on that, that later, because I think it really is, um, you have to be the lifelong learner. You have to be receptive to taking that information because it really will shape shape how you think and and create the life and the opportunities they start to come to you and you, you have the opportunities there and the life that you really desire and i think i just think it's an absolutely fascinating fascinating subject and what i'd like to do kind of bill is really delve into this um even further and really discuss and i think we've we've touched upon it but really discuss the importance of being a lifelong learner and what that actually means and then i'd like to kind of focus on how we keep and how we maintain the growth mindset and also how it's actually helped you in your business being a lifelong learner because i think it really is uh, the foundation as well of creating that uh, confidence that you and self-belief that you get when you start to develop your mindset your growth mindset and really start to absorb absorb information and I just think as the world is such a changing world right now we really must stay relevant we really need to stay relevant and I think um, the growth mindset and I also think about learning within the business um, really helps you to stay relevant. So what I'd like to do, uh, Bill, is really to start asking you to share your thoughts on how lifelong learning really fosters an ongoing growth mindset and why it is really so imperative to continue learning and growing and how it actually can have that impact on our personal and our professional, professional lives. Well, kind of going back, Rachel, to that story on, on five trending to one, uh, I just want to build upon that. I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, the mindset that I'm trying to foster now is one of, I want to remain humble. Like I said, I want to remain teachable. Uh, you know, there was a scene in the movie Avatar where they were talking about working with that, that Marine and they had the cup, right? And you probably remember that scene uh, yeah. where they said, you can't, you can't pour into a cup that's full. And uh, he said, uh, sure, me, because my cup is empty. And 
you know, that whole point of that particular comment was that uh, to be able to receive from somebody else, you have to kind of make room, right? And you got to empty out that cup. And so, you know, uh, for a lot of us, our cup is full and we're saying we don't have any more room. And we need to actually take that cup and we need to pour it out and say, you know what, I, I like some more. I like, to, I like to learn some more things. And that takes humility uh, in that because a lot of us, we're going to hold on to that cup. We're going to hold on to say, I worked a lot to get this thing full. And, you know, it's like, well, yeah, it's full and it's serving me, but I also want to get more. So I need to empty this out so I can take in more information. So to me, it's remaining humble. It's remaining teachable. I also want to make sure, though, is that I do want to acknowledge my, my strengths. I want to acknowledge the, the path, the growth that I have had. So I don't want to sit there and just say, you know what, um, geez, Rachel, I'm, I don't really know anything. Um, and I need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, always kind of... Um, uh, be more submissive to the other individual. No, I, I, I do recognize that I've, I have a lot of accomplishments. I've made a lot of strides. I do want to make sure I acknowledge that. I have to uh, make uh, reward myself for that. But I also want to acknowledge that there's so much more to learn. Um, when I kind of think about this right now a little bit is um, uh, when we're learning, we're kind of making deposits and we're making deposits into our future. And, and I want to keep making deposits in my future. But I also needed to make withdrawals. Uh, withdrawals is when I'm, I'm taking what I've learned and I'm, I'm then applying it and I'm using it and I'm, and I'm honing it and, inter and interacting with what I've learned and I'm experiencing what I've learned. And I'm seeing what really does work, what survives um, theory into reality. I mean, a lot of things that probably you've read, Rachel, and our viewers have read, is, you know, makes sense on paper, but it doesn't survive the light of day when we start to engage in it. And so for me, I'm always looking at a balance of, of really putting in withdrawals and then taking out deposits. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at that balance between the two. If I'm just making deposits all the time, and I've known some people that just do that, they're just learning, 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 learning. The challenge that I see with that and you go, geez, how could there be a challenge with just learning? Is that they become very theoretical. So everything that they've read, you know, it makes a lot of sense, but they don't really know how to apply it. And so I, I've got a couple of my friends like that, you know, and I call them Google uh, because they have great answers to everything. <laughs> but I'm trying to encourage them to actually then engage and use it. And so there are times when I need to, to, to have those withdrawals as well, which is take what I've learned. Let's apply it. Let's see what works. Let's see how I make it my own as well. So it's kind of that balance that we're really looking at all the time, uh, which is acquiring knowledge and then learning and execution as well. And I think if you have that mindset and you make it intentional, uh, that would actually help serve you much better. Absolutely. And I think the word execution in terms of acting on what you're learning is it's crucial. It's absolutely key. Uh, we we can we can learn, but if we don't act, if we don't execute on it, it's not actually going to have an impact on our, our lives or our business. What ha you know? How has lifelong learning really helped you in your business? Is there something that you could really share with us on that? You know, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna back up for a second, Rachel. I wanna uh, I also wanted to share something in that yeah. uh, you know um, both my you know, both my parents uh, were teachers, uh, and so they were uh, elementary ed teachers and high school teachers. And, and so our house was always kind of filled with books. And, you know, you, you look at your, your set behind you, look at me behind me, right? And we have books everywhere. And, and books were kind of something to be prized um, and something that, that has value to us. And, um, you know, my dad just turned 90. My mom is in her, her mid mid to late 80s. I won't tell you her exact age. But, um, uh, you know, what I really love is that I look at my parents and they are great role models and have always been great role models for lifelong learning because my mom is very proficient with the iPad. Uh, she, you know, every once in a while I'll bust her chops on something, but I'm also, I'm in the technology field. So I have a different perspective on things. And she reminds me, she goes, Bill, there's not a lot of people that are, that are my age that are able to be, uh, get on the iPad to be able to do FaceTime, have Alexa working in the house, have Alexa hooked up to uh, some of the equipment to turn lights on and off and so on. And I'm like, yeah, actually, that, that really is true. And and um, 
And my dad is, you know, he, he just turned 90 and he's constantly, constantly reading. My dad has been a deacon in the Catholic church for 45 years. And so he's always reading material just because of that uh, vocation to, um, to actually get content for sermons. And just recently I had sent him a book, uh, one of the books we were talking about yesterday, Rachel, which was Dr. Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief. I had sent that to him uh, last year. I said, Dad, I really think you might find this book interesting. And so I, I, um, I, uh, my dad is, is hard of hearing, so I usually have to talk to my mom on the phone and find out how my dad's doing. And uh, I said, Mom, how's dad doing with the book? Did he get it? She goes, oh, he's almost finished with it. You know, I'm like, well, he only got it like three days ago. And she's like, oh, no. He's, she goes, he's reading it, and then he keeps going in to his office. And I go, well, what's he doing there? And she goes, he's on, he's, she goes, he's on this thing like YouTube, I think. And I go, what's he doing on YouTube? Because he's watching all these videos of Dr. Bruce Lipton. And she goes, I didn't even know what YouTube was. And I didn't even know he knew how to get onto YouTube. But he's now watching all these YouTube videos that Dr. Bruce Lipton is talking about the biology of belief and about the different content of his chapter. And I only bring that up, and I'm, I'm kind of diverting from your question initially there, Rachel, because for me, that is what a lifelong learner looks like. My parents have modeled it. For me, they have modeled it for my for my other four siblings, and it's something that is continual. It's not. I don't ever think I've arrived. I'm thinking like, what else can I do? How far can I go? I'm not thinking of that of the destination. I'm thinking of how far can I really get into this particular topic? How much more mastery can I get? And with that, that has served me uh, really well because if I'm just if I'm just doing withdrawals all the time, eventually that bank account is going to be empty. And it can be challenging because when that bank account is empty, that's often when something really bad happens uh, in the market. You know, we had the 2001 internet bust and we had a lot of people out of work then. We had the 2008 um, uh, fiasco uh, with the, um, with, uh, the, uh, the loans. And then we had 2020. All right. And so these things keep happening. Yeah. And to me, it's, are you investing in yourself to stay marketable? Are you, and, and it's the difference between being marketable and employable in yeah. my mind. Now, one can say that they're synonyms. I look at it a little bit differently. I, employable is, am I doing everything that I might need to be doing to be employed by that employer? But for me, marketable is, am I doing the things that are going to always keep me employable at any place, at anywhere. And so I'm always kind of looking at that, that horizon and saying, what else should I be learning? And in the chapter, I talk about calling that more like the big surf. And you're always kind of looking um, at, that, at those waves that are coming. You say, what else should I be focusing on? What else should I be doing? And this has been important to me, Rachel, because... Um, you know, I, my focus had, has been and still will be technology because I just love technology. But when we started to work with companies, we realized that leadership was an area that needed assistance. And so we started to invest in really getting ourselves to be more knowledgeable about leadership. Well, what was really nice about this is that when my tech work finished up with that, with that client, then they said, we want to continue with you guys on the leadership work. And I said, oh, that's great. And so in some ways, the leadership work and that new skill I picked up wanted being a, a nice longer tail to the work that we were doing. And that's happened more than once with clients where we came in, we worked with them on the technology side. I'm not saying it has to work that way, but we worked with them on the technology side. And then they started to realize that they needed some leadership. And then we started to give them a leadership work. And so that actually just really helped kind of broaden our engagement with our clients, which help make it uh, uh, deeper and richer. And looking at 2020, 2020 was probably difficult for many of us. And I'd have to say it was definitely, you know, it was difficult for me as well. The, the, um, the thing that was interesting in, in 2020 is that a lot of the technical work that I was doing just disappeared. It disappeared within 30 days. However, the leadership work continued. And so if I had just focused only on the, the technical work that I had been doing, um, you know, I would have had no revenue coming in. But instead, I had multiple 
things I could go to. I had multiple things that I could wind up taking out of the bank. I could draw upon. And so leadership was one. Another one that became really popular in 2020 was, was really personal growth because we had people that were starting to now question their lives, question their careers, question really, am I doing what I really want to do? Because 2020, in my opinion, was almost like the great reset. It allowed us to look at and say, am I, am I uh, really doing what makes me uh, uh, happy? Am I passionate about this? There's a comedian, Rachel, uh, Lily Tomlin, and Lily Tomlin said, um, she goes, um, the only problem with winning a rat race is that you're still a rat. And so many of us in 2020 started to realize, you know what, I'm winning the rat race, but I'm still a rat and I want something different. And so for me, lifelong learner, because I had invested in it, it actually gave me multiple things to draw upon. When one thing dried up, I had something else to then still do. Yeah, um, I, I think I, you know, I, I think the rat race, I think that, I, I love that. I absolutely love that. Yeah, you win the rat race, but you're still in it. And I think um, being receptive, you're bringing, you know, the, about being receptive to, to really the lifelong learning. And I think how you've demonstrated through your own business that by doing lifelong learning, it is absolutely uh, in this crazy world that we're in, 2020, it's, it's really helped uh, your business um, keep going and, and grow. And I want to go back to, um, and you mentioned your chapter in, in uh, the book, Jack Canfield's book, Success. And I want to go back to that. And I really, first of all, want to really congratulate you because your chapter is incredible. It is exceptionally well written. And also, I think, I think it does. It really makes you think. And in there, you know, you really um, are kind of focusing on uh, the uh, position of an employer in there. And what I'd like you to really share with us is, can you elaborate on the, the question that you bring up in your chapter, which is, uh, you know, how many of us in life are really are expecting our boss, our employers to really give us direction they we expect that to happen we expect to be told what to do we expect to have that direction and i think it's really important to bring this up in in the conversation that we're having today because people get really really comfortable with their role they get comfortable with with the position they get comfortable in their own business and i think you've you've touched upon that most certainly in what we were just talking about um in the last few minutes but people really stop actively learning for themselves within the business and within the roles and it is until something absolutely happens like 2020 like COVID and I just want to kind of go into that even more and really elaborate on this because uh, you mentioned it in your chapter and I just I just love what you, you know I love this chapter and I really do think uh, everybody should should get this book they should get success they should read this because what you're bringing up, the topics that you you are raising, really makes really makes you think. So, um, could you just elaborate a little bit more on that, Bill, for me? Yeah, you know, it's um, as I was reflecting on it as you're asking the question there and putting it out there. Um, I I never forget when I was it was the late '80s and and I was uh, my parents were driving me up to my uh, first job. Right. And so I had graduated college and about two weeks later, I was starting my first job. And so my parents were driving me up and, and my, my, my parents, while I talked about them being great role models for continuous learning, they also grew up in a different era, which that era was one of you worked for 35 years for, uh, for a particular employer. And at the end of 35 years, you retire and you, you have a retirement ceremony and you get a gold watch and then you start playing golf. And and my dad said to me when we were driving up, we were going through Hartford, Connecticut, and he said, uh, he goes, Bill, welcome to where you're going to live for the rest of your life. And I go, oh, wow, I didn't even think of it like that. And I really thought my first job that I was going to be there for the rest of my life. And this is where I was going to live and where I was going to establish roots and, you know, and uh, raise a family and so on. And 
nowadays that idea seems very antiquated. No one would think about probably, you know, joining a job or joining a company and being there for 35 years. But I really want to ask the viewers this question here right now, which is, is while that idea may seem antiquated to you, what are you doing today to ensure that you're marketable tomorrow? Right? If you don't think you're going to be someplace for 35 years, what are you doing today? What are you investing in in yourself so that you can make sure you're being marketable tomorrow? Because many of us, while we don't, we, while we kind of smile at that idea of working there for 35 years, our investment strategy in ourselves is one of, well, I have a job. Why do I need to continue to, to learn? And I also think some of that happens, Rachel, because life happens. Um, you know, we get married. We have, we have children, we're raising the children, and you just don't have enough time in the day. You know, it's like, where do I get this time to invest? And the employer, we, we think that our employer is gonna guide our career. And some employers do, and I'm not saying that they don't. Some employers will help guide your career. I know when I've worked with my team, I used to try to give them career advice that would help serve them longer term, not just for what I needed them to do. But many employers are gonna push you to learn things or encourage you to learn things that suits the employer, that helps them get something done. And that's that makes sense, right? That's They're employing you, they wanna make sure that they're getting value from you. But if they're doing that, that's not enough. You actually need to be looking at what do I need to do to consider to keep myself marketable at all times. And so I wanna make, I really want you to be thinking about how am I investing in my, in my future? You know, a question that kinda, goes through my mind, and I do ask uh, the clients that I coach, I said, what will you do on Monday if Friday is your last day of work at this company? If you find out that they're doing a reduction in workforce, if they're doing layoffs, I said, what are you going to be able to do on Monday? Now, that seems kind of like a fear-based approach. I'm not trying to strike fear into them, but I'm trying to say, are you prepared, right? I really want them to always know I've got multiple things that I can fall back on. And what is kind of fun is, as well, when you look at this and you start to learn things, um, you start realizing how much there is more to learn in this. And so sometimes I, I, I get into something and start learning it. And I start to just scratch that surface, Rachel. Um, and I start realizing there's so much more. Now, my employer maybe just gave me a slight introduction into it. But if I'm interested in it and if I'm passionate about it, then I might go deeper into it and I may learn more about it. But I definitely want you to always be thinking about if, if something happened today, how am I gonna be more marketable uh, in the future? How am I gonna be more marketable? What can I do? And I don't want you to get caught up. Like I, in, my, in the chapter, I told the story about, um, I, had, I was caught up in a layoff and I wound up, it's actually really kind of crazy, Rachel, because there's a job that I drove back and forth to for five years. And when I, when my boss told me I was being laid off uh, that evening, we were sitting in the parking lot talking and he goes, Bill, you're, you're going to get laid off. And I was driving back home on a route that I drove for five years and I couldn't remember how to drive home. I actually got lost driving home. All right. And that's because I was, you know, my, my, my brain, my mind was just, you know, kind of, all over the place drifting and i had i had two girls i had a uh i had two girls underneath the age of three and i come home and i tell my wife that you know i've just been let go and we had less than two months of money sitting in our bank account for, to pay our bills and and you know looking back now some ways rachel ignorance was just bliss because i didn't realize how in how much trouble we were really in and that wound up being a major kickstart for me to say, Bill, you got to always remain marketable. And I had a big two month push to kind of really get myself up and go up and running again. And that's when I really moved heavily into consulting instead. But I don't ever want anyone to have that feeling. My wife and I standing in, in front of the stove in our kitchen, uh, looking at each other, I'm telling her I was let go and we're both crying. And, uh, and she goes, you're going to find this funny. She goes, I think I might be pregnant. And we hugged each other and laughed. And I say, boy, does God have a sense of humor uh, in all of this? And so, you know, part of the reason why I wrote the chapter the way I did is because that fear that I had 
I don't want anyone to ever have that kind of fear. I want them to feel that they can stand on their own two feet no matter what happens to them. Absolutely. And I, you, you, you raise life gets in the way. And I, we do. We just can get up, do the same routines all the time and not just take that time out and, and actually be doing everything for um, other people and not investing in, our, in ourselves and not and not taking that time out, as you say, to be marketable, to really keep ourselves relevant to, and so, as you say, you're not put in a position where no job, uh, having to pay, think about how to pay the bills and another child on the way. Um, and I think it can be so difficult uh, for us to kind of open our eyes to really the, the wonders of the world and what it, actually has to offer because life does get in the way and we don't fully invest in ourselves and we don't therefore then reach our full full potential because the more we the more we learn the more we know but the truth is as, as you've said throughout this we can never know it all but that growth that development if we serve others in a way that we're making a value, adding a contribution, we are going to stay relevant. We are going to be far, far more marketable. The more we serve others, the more we add value to other people's lives, the more valuable we become. And we touched on it earlier as well. Um, and I think this is really uh, important to, to come back to this because when we are in a position, when we are in a role, when we're running a business, we can really sometimes confuse this with, with being our identity. And mm. um, we, we put ourselves in a position and then we're thinking that that's our ego, that's who we are. But I want you to kind of really explain even further the the ego and really how we can become curious in life, how we can actually open open our eyes up to the world and what it has to offer, so that we can truly reach our reach our full potential. Yeah, Rachel, I forget the the exact author's name. I think his last name is Holiday, and he wrote a book called "The Ego Is the Enemy," and. Um, I had read that book. Um, you know, for me, I, I have a very much a type A personality. I am, I am uh, an achiever. I'm always trying to reach that that the highest point, that pinnacle. And I was realizing that my ego is getting in the way a lot. And um, and uh, for those of you who might be struggling, uh, like like I was in that particular space, it's a great book to read. It's called "Ego Is the Enemy," um, but. If I, if I think about, about ego, there was a story that came to mind uh, when I was working with a client out, out in, uh, in Illinois. I was consulting with them, and I was in a, uh, a, a project management class. And, and while, even though I was consulting with them, Rachel, they said, Bill, we really want you to sit in this class because we want to make sure that you know what we're being taught so that it aligns with what you're consulting us with us on. And I said, okay, that's great. You know, I'm happy to do that. You're paying me, so I'm happy to sit in this class. And it was like a three-day class or something like that. And the, the instructor came up to me during the class in the first day, and he said, you know, Bill, you know, you're more than welcome uh, to be in this class. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, you're, but if you want, you're allowed to take the test at the end of this class so you can get certified in what we're, in what we're teaching here in project management. And he goes, or you could just audit it. If you want to just audit it instead, and I, and I said, "Oh, look, I really appreciate that," you know. And so I, I sat through the class and I thought about his his um, his offer that he had made, and I started thinking all these horrible things, Rachel. Which was, you know, well, what if I, what if I take him up on his offer, and what if I actually take the test? But what if I don't pass the test? What if I'm in this I'm in this class, I take the test, I don't pass. How is that going to look to my client? Right? I'm supposed to be the expert here, and that's why they brought me in as a consultant. And now I'm 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 not passing, you know, this particular test. Um, and then I then I start going, what if I don't take the test? How's that going to look to the client if I don't take the test? You know, it's going to be oh, you know, the test and the content is good for you guys, but not good enough for me. So I sat there like that whole night, 
the, the first first day of the class, I sat there going, should I take it? Should I not take it? I don't know what I should do. Eventually, I said, look, you got to put your fear aside. You got to put your ego aside, right? And, and the fear was really coming out of, you know, how is my how is my ego going to feel if I don't do well taking this thing? And so I had to put my fear aside. I had to put my ego aside. And I did wind up uh, taking the test. And that was, that was actually a, a kind of an inflection point for me because I started to lean more into, you know what, Bill, you got you to gotta stop worrying about how other people are going to see this. How are other people going to be, to be viewing you uh, in this? And you got to do what's good for you. And you got to do what you think makes sense. And, and so when I moved from kind of auditing the class to actually attending the class, my attention span changed tremendously. All of a sudden now I was writing a lot of notes because I wanted to make sure I understood the content. If you're auditing the class, you just sit there and you kind of just let it wave over you and you just kind of let the information come at you. And so for me, um, you know, looking at this, um, it was really important uh, to, to really hit that ego. And the ego was really, how am I going to look to others? Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a quote that is often um, associated with Dr. Wayne Dyer, but I actually think it's from, from uh, uh, Maslow, which is, you know, be free of the good opinions of others. And for many of us, when, we, when we're starting something, we're very concerned about what everybody else is going to think. And we're afraid also of whatever that's going to do to our status. Uh, that we have. And for me, I'm, I'm definitely working harder and harder. I'm, I can tell you, I don't, I don't have it down, but I'm continuing working harder and harder, Rachel, at being free of the good opinions of others. Many people have well, well wishes or good ideas, but I have to do what's best for me. And I'm always got to look at what I, what I, where I want to be going. I think I thought being free of the opinions of others is so incredibly important. Um, and I am I'm sharing that it really helps you develop that and remove those limiting beliefs um, the ego the limiting beliefs and um, stepping stepping out of your fear stepping out of your comfort zone and into that growth mindset and I think let's let's delve now a little bit deeper into into the growth mindset because there's the two basic mindsets there's the the fixed and there's the growth mindset and and what we really want to be talking about here is we really want to be talking about that growth mindset. We've touched upon the fixed, not learning, not wanting to really expand your knowledge, really take in what the world has to offer for you. And I, what I'd really like to ask you is really what advice would you give to people that are struggling to, to really maintain that growth mindset and have, you know, get rid of that negative internal dialogue dialogue that they may have that's a that's a great great question it's a it's a hard question to answer i think everybody's going to have a slightly different journey through this um first thing i'll say to folks when i'm when i'm, when I'm coaching uh, individuals and so on i'll say guys you got to start small right you got to start small i want you to take small steps baby steps but the biggest thing i want you to be is, is if you can is i want you to be consistent um, and so, you know, as they're trying to move towards that growth mindset, you know, many of us go up, want to make these big grandiose declarations. You know, you watch people that decide that they're going to go on a diet and they put it on Facebook that they're going on a diet and they're losing this weight and so on. And, um, many times I actually, for my really big goals, Rachel, I don't tell a lot of people about them yet. Uh, I want to get momentum. I want to see how it feels. I want to see, do I still have the same conviction for this particular goal two weeks from now or a month from now as I did when I first, when I first started it? Um, there is going to be that, uh, for many of us, and at least for me, I, I can only speak for myself, is there, you know, I, I usually have, I kind of think of the cartoons when I was a kid with Bugs Bunny, where they'd have the, the, the <laughs> angel and the devil sitting on their shoulders. And I usually have, I usually have the angel saying one thing and the devil saying something else. And, and, um, and my mom's going to get upset with me if she watches this video. The devil is my mom's voice, all right, which she's going to be so upset with when she hears that. Yeah. But, um, and there's no reason really why, but it just happens to always be her voice uh, for some reason. And um, 
and I'm always having like this internal dialogue and I'm always, I'm starting to become more and more aware of how am I talking to myself? What am I saying to myself? I mean, the biggest conversations that we, you know, we have all day long is inside our heads with ourselves. And most of us would fire ourselves if we actually made that dialogue external and we read it and we looked at it, we would just fire and say, you know, my God, you're not a good friend or you're not a good boss. You're not a good employer or you're not a good client because you're talking to me so negatively. And so part of it is I, I've definitely had to pay attention to my, my, my dialogue of what's going on inside my mind. I mean, there are things um, uh, that I, I'll do and I go, geez, I'm so stupid, you know? And, I'm like, and then I'm like, well, why am I saying that? You know? And, and, and we, we talked about this, you know, I am, I am so stupid, right? And so now this is a declaration that has been fed into my subconscious that I am stupid. Um, you know, and rather maybe I should say, hey, you know, what did I learn from this? I just did something, didn't work out the way I thought I was gonna work out, but what, what did I learn from this? I now learned something better. I learned something that doesn't work. I learned a, a much better path. The growth mindset is one that it's not, it's not destination focused, all right? Uh, it's infinite. See, a growth mindset says, I'm sorry, a, a fixed mindset says, I'm going to get to that destination. When I get there, I'll be happy. But a growth mindset is one that I think is infinite. It's one which is, how far can I keep going? How much more can I keep learning on this? I've actually really enjoyed, Rachel, where I'm now reading things, and when they're when they're putting a quote in there, and they didn't quote it correctly, or they didn't reference it correctly, I go, that's from that book. They don't. They didn't actually cite that right. Or that's not what that author was really meaning to say because they took it out of context because I read the other, the other book or the other five books that, that they wrote about. But, but having a growth mindset when you're kind of stuck, um, you know, it's, it's one where I'd, I would just suggest start small um, and never underestimate the effects of compounding though. So what I do is every day I have an hour. And, um, you know, typically it's between 7 and, and 8 a.m., which that hour is for me. And then in that 7 to 8 a.m., I sit down, I have a cup of coffee, and I'll be reading a book. Um, the commitment that I've made to myself, Rachel, is I'm going to read for 15 minutes. I'm like, I can do anything for 15 minutes is what I'm thinking. So I'm going to read for 15 minutes while I'm sitting there having my coffee and just kind of getting the day going. But what often happens is that 15 minutes, which is what I committed to myself, becomes 30 minutes or becomes 40 minutes because I get pulled into whatever I happen to be reading. But my commitment is just 15 minutes. And if I'm not feeling it, after 15 minutes, I stop, and that's okay. Um, but if I look at this, you know, if I just re read like 10 pages a day, if I could just read 10 pages a day, and I even give you off Saturday and Sunday, and so just doing it for five days a week, right? that's 520 pages that I could yeah. wind up getting through. All right, and that's like two or three books. That's two or three books that I could wind up uh, reading in a span of a year. Uh, and if it's not 15 pages or 10 pages, if it's 15 minutes watching a video, watching a YouTube um, uh, uh, video about a particular topic, whatever it happens to be, to me it starts to become compounding. And what you're trying to do, as you know, Rachel, is we're trying to make this a habit. So the reason why it's in my calendar is because A, I want to make sure that no one count calendars or schedules over it. And, and B, in the beginning, I needed to be reminded to do it. Now I get up, I get, a, I get a cup of coffee, and I have my book already sitting there on the kitchen table where I'm going to pick up and I'm going to start to read it. I think habit, intention, uh, commitment, um, reading the book 15, 15 minutes with the cup of coffee. I think the cup of coffee is very, very important. <laughs> or tea, I'm okay with tea too. Or tea, or tea. I, I like a good cup of tea. Or tea um, is so important. And I think this brings us uh, on to, you quote in your chapter, you quote John Max, Maxwell, and you quote that growth requires intentionality. It requires a plan and it takes work. And how how do we become really intentional about having that growth growth mindset? And I think you've you've begun to share that. But um, if you could just elaborate a, a little sure. bit more, Bill, that would be great. You know, uh, you know, John's written over a hundred books, and I'm a I'm also a John Maxwell leadership coach. And um, 
And so I've learned a lot from him over the last six or seven years as I've, as I've been around him. Um, but uh, to me, I talked about this already, you got to make a commitment to yourself. And the one thing that I have found is that the person that I lie to the most and the person that I break the commitments to the most is myself. And, and so I have to start to say, you know what, Bill, you are important. You need to have this time. It's not a nice to have. You ha it's a must have. You must give yourself this time. You must give this time to invest in yourself. So I really want people to make a commitment. I mean, you're going you're gonna to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to break some commitments. And there are some days where I'm, I'm just not feeling it. I can tell you, I don't do it perfect every day. Uh, but the next day, I say, all right, didn't do it. You know. The one thing I love about about like uh, your your iWatch or your Fitbit is uh, it's a great metaphor in some ways for whatever you did yesterday it doesn't really matter. You got you're starting again today, and so if you're trying to do ten thousand steps, if you did twenty thousand steps yesterday, that's all, it's all well and good. But today you still got to do ten thousand steps, and so the Fitbit or your or your iWatch just cycles back over again. And says, hey, that was great, that, but that was yesterday. Now what are you doing today? What are you doing today? And so to me, it's, it's trying to stay focused on that particular commitment that you made and, and make sure that, that that time that you have is sacred to you. So that's really how I, I would try to sum it up uh, for folks, uh, Rachel. No, thank you. I think um, we do, we commit to others, but we don't commit to ourselves. We do not commit to ourselves. We let ourselves down. And making that that commitment and being honest uh, with yourself um, really can so help with developing uh, your growth mindset and being a lifelong learner because you are making that commitment to invest in yourself and you mustn't, you know, we mustn't let ourselves down. And we have touched on this and I just want to go back to it just, just, um, just a little bit more. That... Mm -hmm. We really do listen to quite often the approval of others, and we talked about it a bit in uh, fear, ego. We listen to the approval of others, and that stops us uh, in ways of developing our our growth mindset. It, it it we have fear. We believe other people more than actually our our own vo our own voice. How can what tips what what techniques would you say? we could use to gain confidence in ourselves and really stop letting others uh, thoughts get in the way of get in the way of our growth you know it's um it, it's a it's an interesting question uh it's somewhat of a challenge here because on on my really big goals that i've had in my life rachel i've learned to not tell people my big goals um I actually want to get further along and make more progress on my goal before I start to tell people about it. Um, you know, in our, our book that you and I both co-authored together, Success with, with John, uh, with, with, uh, with Jack Canfield, um, I didn't tell my business partner about it, right? So here it was, you know, I'm making a large investment in time. I didn't tell my business partner about it until I had already agreed to do it agreed on the chapter and started to write the chapter. I didn't tell my mother or my father about it until actually I had the chapter written. There was only one person I told, which was my wife. And um, I told her because I wanted her to know uh, because she's gonna be like, Where, what are you doing this week? And why are you always in your office working? And also my wife, who I'm quite blessed with, ha is a great supporter. And she's always been like, well, if that's what you want, you really want to do, well, go ahead and do it, you know? And so on my big goals, I have a tendency to keep them closer to myself until I start to get a lot of momentum. You know, it's, it's funny, Rachel, um, a couple of years back, um, I was writing some affirmations and I had an affirmation that I wanted to have a dozen consultants working for me. And... I wrote that affirmation at the time I had nobody working for me. In fact, I wasn't, I was in between contracts when I wrote the affirmation. All right. So I didn't, even, I wasn't even working at the time, but I wanted a dozen consultants working for me. And the coach that I had at the time, I shared with him that particular goal. And all he did was tell me how difficult it was 
to have a dozen people working for me, how hard it was going to make to make payroll, um, how hard it was going to be to manage the bench, how hard it was going to be for me to have insurance uh, for this, and how hard it was going to be for me to manage them as opposed to doing the work myself. The only thing that I, I got out of that conversation is I actually put that coach on hold. I stopped talking to that coach. All right. That's what happened to me because I said, well, that's the dream that I have. And so he was trying to forewarn me and he was trying to do things with good intent. But in fact, he was he was really kind of killing my dream. Now, the beautiful thing about it is about about seven years later or so or five years later or so, I, I caught up with him again. And I really enjoyed telling him that I now had 14 plus people working for me, that I had done it, right? And I also was, I also was kind of happy with the fact that I was just ignorant enough in all of this that I thought I could do it. And he was right in a lot of things that he said, but that was a greater desire for me to have the, to experience that in my life than it was to have the fear. And so I wound up ignoring him, you know. I think I was telling you the other day that, you know, I got a trademark for, for it's your time to lead. And so I, I wound up getting the trademark. I just went online. I did a search. I filled out some paperwork. I submitted it in uh, to, the, to the U.S. Patent Office. I then wound up consulting with a lawyer that said, oh, you can't do that. That's not going to work. You're never going to get that trademark. That's, that's, too, that's too common. It's your time to lead. You can't get that trademark. And um, I just had on my calendar... Mark six months because it takes about six months for that process to go through. I filled out the paperwork exactly the way they wanted and, and what they said, and I took some great pleasure in kind of reaching back out to him. Said, "Hey, by the way, I got that trademark." And so, what I'm really trying to focus on here is for big dreams, Rachel. Rachel, I keep it to myself. I want to get progress because a lot of people will tell you what you can't do, and you know we've all heard about probably that. Uh, about crabs. I'm not sure if this is true because I'm not a, an eater of crabs, but if you put one crab in, a, in a, a basket, that crab will try to crawl out and can typically get out. And you got to put a lid on top of that basket. But I've also heard that as soon as you put two crabs in the basket, the one, the other crab won't let the, the first crab uh, crawl out. They will grab them with their claw and pull them back down. And they don't need to put a lid. On the, on the basket then because the crabs will keep each other down. And in some ways, you know, while we have our loved ones and people around us that really mean well, they can often be the killer of the dream. And so I have to keep saying, well, you know what, is this dream really that important to me? Is this something I really want? If I do really want that, let me hold this to myself for a period of time. Because you know what, I already have a lot of self-doubt. I already have a lot of self-talk that is that is sabotaging. I already have the angel and the devil on my shoulder. I don't need to put more weight here for the for the the devil uh, to be talking to me. So for me, again, I go back to be free of the good opinions of others. You know, people have well-meaning wishes to try to assist us. They want to make sure they're saving you from your pain. But I, I'm really c conscious of this now, Rachel, with my children. When my kids tell me something, I try not to give them a judgmental comment back. I go, okay, that's great. Why don't you go for it? You know. And if they want to ask me more questions, I'm happy to give them advice on things. But the advice I'm giving them is advice that's pushing them towards their dream or towards their goal, not advice that's holding them back. No, um, thank you for that. And I think um, you're sharing the story of the crabs. That's a new one for me. I've learned. I've learned. I'm, I've learned something about crabs. <laughs> I've learned something. About I don't know crabs. if it's true or not, but I, I've heard that <laughs> okay, story and it stayed in my out. mind. I'm going to find out, but I, I like that. And I, I think uh, when you have a dream, you must follow it. And if it's to keep it close to you uh, and not share until you're ready to do so, then then that's, that's I think that that's wonderful, wonderful advice. So I'm going to ask you one more question, Bill, and I'm going to ask you. So once we've defined our purpose, our dream, our purpose, we want to pursue our passion and we found our voice, we've gained our confidence, we're uh, really in the growth mindset. How do we use all of this to really grow our business? How do we use the tools that we've been talking about to really um, grow our business? You know, I, I'm i going to start off with really, really want to align passion with purpose. Um, 
I am a, a believer of if you are passionate about what you're doing, um, it's going to be evident. It's going to be obvious to people that you're working with. Uh, my wife sometimes walks by my office and she asks me, you know, it'd be late at night. You know, this morning she said, you know, you know what are you doing this morning? Uh, she was wondering why I was in here at six o'clock in the morning. Um, but I'll say to her, like many times she'll say, well, Bill, are you, are you playing in there or are you working? And um, I have to often think about that because when I'm doing what I'm passionate about, Rachel, it feels like play. It really does. I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm not saying it's time to go work in the salt mines. It's not drudgery. It's not something that, that is, is uh, kind of sucking the energy out of me. I generally, I used to be a night person. I used to stay up late at night. Um, and over the last 10 years, as I've created this, this new company, uh, you know, uh, the Time Elite Institute, I have become a morning person because I can't wait to get up. I can't wait to get up and I can't wait to start doing the work that I want to be doing. And it doesn't feel like work. Uh, when I collaborate with my business partner, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. We, we push each other. When I work with my clients, you know, I'll sit there and I'll have a session with my client for an hour and we'll go two hours because I just enjoy doing the work. Um, and so it's been a, an interesting thing for me because in my early 20s, I really wanted to seek kind of fame and fortune. And I, and I had this vision of being on the cover of Time magazine. And I had this vision of having my team around me and building this, this uh, software solution or this software product that would just revolutionize the world. And I've, over the years, it's changed. And now in my 50s, you know, I'm not chasing the money. Um, I used to really define success by my, my profit and loss margin, by my, my gross profit, uh, by the number of clients that I had. And, and that's a very traditional way in which many of us define success and how society defines success often for us. But I've started looking at this now. Of, I'm not chasing the money. I'm really trying to chase being of service. And if I can be of service to individuals and if I can help other people achieve their dreams. If I can help one other person with m one of my stories to help them not have the same pain that I experienced uh, uh, in my life, uh, then to me, that's really important. And, and so to me, this is kind of the way that I'm growing my business now is really being one of service. And, I'm, and, and being of service is following my passions. And as long as my passions are things that clients also want, and I I see a lot of clients that I'm working with now who want to want to want to learn how to be better leaders. They want to know how to um, uh, grow themselves as leaders. You know, uh, uh, there was a funny story, Rachel, with uh, with John Maxwell, where he was teaching a, a group of individuals about leadership, and this one young gentleman was like, "I really love this leadership stuff you're talking about." And he came up to John during a during a break, and he says, "I I really want to know how to become a better leader. What can I do?" And John said. Learn to lead yourself. And the guy was like underwhelmed because he wanted to go off and lead others, right? And you can't lead others if you don't know how to lead yourself. You can't help others be, be growth mindset if you're not growth mindset individual, right? If you're not passionate about the work that you do, why would your clients be passionate about working with you? Now, to me, I don't really look at this as a job. And I've said this and I believe this is that if I won the lottery tonight or tomorrow, I would still be doing this because I love the work that I'm doing. It, it's a lot of fun. And that to me is how I'm really focusing on my business, which is to me, it's stay aligned with my passions, always remain curious, remain humble, and have that growth mindset. And if I do that, I don't think I can lose. Wow, thank you. I. I I think uh, we have tackled so many really good nuggets of good nuggets of wisdom today, uh, Bill. And thank you. I'm just so, so uh, grateful to have had the opportunity to really talk with you today. And, and thank you ever, ever so much for, for joining me. What would be great if you could just let the viewers know where they can find out a little bit more about you and about your business. Sure. So, um if they'd like to go to our, our website, 
Uh, our website is uh, all one word. It's time to lead.com. All right. So it's time T O time to lead.com. And from there, you can uh, find out a little bit more about some of the services and the products and solutions that we offer. Uh, we do have a, uh, uh, a weekly inspirational email series that we send out. There are little leadership quotes that come to your inbox and, and we do that as a service. And Rachel, it's kind of funny is that while I have these inspirational leadership quotes that come out, I signed up for them myself. <laughs> and because I actually signed up for them originally just to make sure it was working, right? But Every week it comes in Tuesday morning around eight o'clock in the morning, and I open it up. I go, "Oh my God, that really, that really is what I needed this week." And I'm like, "I'm, I'm the one to put the quote together," and and it always seems to show up at the time whenever I needed that particular quote. So that's a that's one uh, that people might be interested in in, in uh, just joining for free. And then we also have our our Facebook group, and you can join our Facebook uh, community right there also from our time to lead dot com uh, website and. Um, and joining in that community there, we do have um, a lot of engagement where we do little kind of micro content. Uh, so we'll put out content on leadership. Uh, my business partner does a lot of leadership stuff. I do more uh, stuff now in the success and the Jack Canfield space. So I talk a lot more about, about personal growth, uh, which is kind of interesting because that does tie right into uh, being an entrepreneur uh, as well. And so those are uh, uh, some things that people might be interested in that are just free that we'd, we'd love to be able to just help them along their journey. Well, I'll be signing up for the inspirational email. I know that. And I know already I'm, I'm in your group. It's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So, so guys, don't miss out on uh, all uh, what Bill has to offer. He has some incredible, uh, incredible support for, for you all. So... I hope that this episode of Mindset Matters has really helped you on your journey to, to really see things differently. And really remember, you are capable of absolutely anything. All that's stopping you is your mindset. So we'll be back next month to explore another topic on, on mindset in depth and I would love you to join me so um, I hope to see you again next month and I host a whole range of live events as well as one-to-one -one coaching as well as training systems and group workshops and you can find me on my website rachelwithershq.co.uk um, I'd love to hear from you DM me as well love to hear from you thanks again for tuning in and I will see you real soon Thanks for tuning in to Mindset Matters. Be sure to visit rachelwithershq.co.uk to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Join us next time for more tips and techniques to achieve the rewards that you deserve. Bye for now.